Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. I am releasing this episode a day early because by tomorrow I will finally be on my way to CrimeCon UK in London, and I can't wait to keep you all updated across social media throughout the weekend. In other news, I want people to know that I am receiving the reviews online and making changes to the episodes here and there, so I do take your advice and criticisms on board. Today's episode is slightly different. Alice has bravely shared her story with me through the written word in response to some interview questions I sent along to her. And with some special help, we are able to deliver this story to you today, highlighting the high demands and coercive methods used within a Japanese new religious movement called Sukyo Mahikari. I hope you enjoy today's episode and thank you so much, Alice, for allowing us this chance to share your experiences. Hello, Ronit, and an extra special welcome back to the show. Today, we have a slightly different format. I've been sent an anonymous account of someone's experience inside a Japanese religious movement that we haven't covered on the show before. And as this person would prefer to remain as anonymous as possible, we have arranged for you, Ronit, to come and read their account to the listeners and answer some interesting questions around this religious group. And I am lucky enough to have spoken to you before on the show, episode 118. But for anyone who hasn't heard that episode or of your work, would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Well, thank you so much, Casey. Um, This is very lovely to be here. And it is a privilege to be able to share this story on behalf of Alice. I, I appreciate the opportunity and I take it very seriously and I'm grateful to be able to do this. So I am a writer, a memoirist, a teacher, and a podcaster and a mom. <laughs> I always have to throw that in. And I have the memoir, When She Comes Back, about the loss of my mom to the guru, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, otherwise known as Osho, and our eventual reconciliation. And I've also written articles on the topic for The Atlantic and The Rumpus and Insider. And I currently am hosting a podcast entitled Let's Talk Memoir, where I interview memoirists about their work and their craft and how they got to tell their stories in the way that they felt most comfortable and most effective. And um, I think that's pretty much it. So you can find me all over the place at Ronit Plank. And I love to connect about coercive control and spiritual abuse. And I love to connect about self-worth. And I am a fierce story advocate. Absolutely, you are. You're, I always (laughs) say, just such a powerhouse of a woman. You are just (laughs) busy all the time promoting Mm -hmm. your work but promoting other people's work as well and helping people get their stories out there um and I am just so lucky that our paths crossed and we get to have this this uh back and um forth connection and I can't think of anyone better to read a story on another person's behalf because your advocacy work is incredible and the person whose story we are going to be looking into today is a person called Alice And Alice is working anonymously in the activism space in highlighting this specific movement. And so to protect that anonymity today, Ronit is going to be reading out the answers to some questions that I sent over to Alice. So Alice's responses will be in Ronit's voice. But occasionally, Roni might decide to break out of character and add her own insights or thoughts around certain responses that Alice has given to the questions. So it's going to be a slightly different format in this episode today. I'm going to be asking the questions and Roni's recorded responses will be inserted into the episode. But before we switch to that more narrated and recorded version... Alice, I believe, did send an introduction of herself to us to begin with, Roni. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's right. So I can just add a little bit of this right now. All right. This is Roni as Alice. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on your podcast, even if it's in a rather convoluted way. I really appreciate your flexibility and Roni's help. So the name of this group is called Sukyo Mahikari. It's often just called Mahikari. Sukyo means supra-religious teaching. In other words, their teachings are above all other religions in the world. 
eye roll. The ma in mahikari means true ma, and hikari means light. That's what they call their purification practice, radiating true light from God. And when was the group formed? Can you give us a little bit of sort of background information on the history of the movement, how it was formed and how it's changed? The group was started with this ex-military guy, and by many accounts he was a war criminal from a wealthy Japanese family called Yoshikazu Okada, who received divine revelations in 1959, but it rapidly gets complicated. In early 1959, Okada received this divine revelation, and this is a direct quote from the Mahakari Bible, Gosegen. The time of heaven has come, rise, thy name shall be Kotama, ball of light. Exercise the art of purification, the world shall enter severe times. At this time, Okada had been part of another sect, Sakai Kyusei Kyo, or SKK for short, they are still around and are the group that practices Jorei purification. It's similar to Reiki, which people might be familiar with, but with religion added in. The fact Okada belonged to this other group first is never mentioned in Mahakari's official teachings. There are rumors that he was kicked out of it for sexual misconduct, but who knows? The teachings he, quote, received from God are almost identical to the teaching of SKK, even to the extent of their two Bibles being practically the same. So, Okada had been a military man serving in Vietnam in the 40s. He established an airplane manufacturing company for the Japanese Air Force in World War II. His company was destroyed in major air raids during the war, so he ended up destitute and worked for many years to pay off his debts according to legend anyway. When he received his revelation from God in 1959, he was told to call himself Kotama. God told him to raise his hand and save others, and that he was responsible for actualizing God's great plan on earth, and was now God's representative on earth. Okada wrote in their Bible, Gosegen, Furthermore, God revealed that he had given me, such a plain man like me, the important mission of establishing a true prosperity for the future of mankind. That is, the mission of the first Messiah, who is to let mankind make a great turn towards the righteous path of tuning in with God. Yep, he just called himself the first Messiah. And here is God talking directly to members about Okada's role. So master here means Okada. Your master is not the master just for you. He is now the master of the eternal life of all mankind as the true God's deputy for this world. For I have had him complete five years of spiritual training of Bodhisattva. Consequently, he has become the master who is the one not only for you, but he is the soul that I shall make the master for all mankind, and whom I shall use for the holy work of establishing God's kingdom. The group Okada formed in 1959 was called L.H. Yokoshi no Tomo. L means lucky and H means happy. Yokoshi means bright or sunlight. So this group was the lucky, happy, sunlight friends. Sounds like a cartoon name, doesn't it? LOL. Then in 1964, he registered a group called Sekai Mahikari Bunmei Kyodan. I'll call it SMBK for short. Eventually, after going through a bunch of different holy names, Okada settled on Skwin Ushisama, which means Great Savior. The group grew and eventually spilled out of Japan, especially during the 1970s, when all things mystical and Eastern had an extra appeal to the West. Okada even met the Pope for a few minutes. A photo of their meeting is plastered everywhere in the group and purchased honors for himself to look like he was great. Okada died in 1974, and then there was a legal fight for succession over the group between the guy who had been appointed as Okada's legal successor and Okada's, quote, adopted daughter, Keishu Okada. Rumors are that it's more likely she was his mistress. The court case went on for years. Eventually, in 1978, the appointed successor was allowed to continue as the leader of Okada's original group, SMBK, and Keishu started Sukyo Mahakari, taking about three-quarters of the SMBK members with her. SMBK still exists, by the way. 
They're more often called the World Divine Light Organization and have eight centers in North America. Members were never told about this legal battle, nor that there was more than one Mahakari organization. I remember the shock that went through our center when we heard about this history over 20 years later. Some people left in disgust as a result. Remember that this was before the internet was around, so we didn't have access to the level of information that's out there now. So there are other Mahikari groups, including a few other much smaller ones. There's even a couple of one and only Mahikari main world shrines around Japan. LOL. Keishu called herself, I mean, God gave her the name Oshien Ushisama, which means great teacher or something like that. She retired from her role in 2009 and died in 2016. Since 2009, there's been a third guy in charge, Mr. Ku Okada. His reign is past my time there, so I don't know much about him, but I gather he's been a member of the group since he was a teenager and was big in their youth group, Mahakari Tai. And is there a single leader of this movement? Yes, there's always just one person who is at the top of the group who is divine. First Okada, then Keishu, then Ku. They are the only ones who can prepare all the holy pendants, apparently, and they're the channel for God's purifying light, which flows from God to the leader, then out to members. Each major region has a head leader as well, called a bucho. So there's a bucho for the North America region, one for the Australia Oceania region, one for the Africa region, and so on. They can be manipulative, charismatic leaders as well, and wield a lot of influence. As they're in direct contact with more members, unlike the holy leader off in Japan, they have a more immediate impact on members. The emperor of Japan is also seen as of divine lineage, so the Japanese royal family is sort of a side player in this game. Members are called Kami Kumite, which means hand in hand with God, or Kumite for short. What are some of the core principles and practices of the group? Is there anything that might make it different or unique from other new religious movements? This will take a while. It's very different from anything Christian-based and complicated. Mahakari's god is called Su God. There's also a bunch of other names for god which are longer and complicated. Su God is a bit easier to say, so Mahakari is monotheistic, but they're also pantheistic, with lots of sub-deities, both at once. They have a mishmash of teachings and influences from a wide range of groups, but especially Shintoism, Japanese Buddhism, Japanese folk religion, shamanism, animism, and spiritualism. There's also New Age stuff and talk about Jesus and the Christian Bible in there too. The basic tenet of Mahakari is, the origin of the world is one, the origin of all human beings is one, and the origin of all religions is one. The origin of all humans and the world is Japan, by the way. The basic deal is that the world is entering severe times. The baptism by fire and the good fire lineage gods, who are male, righteous, and strict, have been led out from behind the rock door of heaven, where the water lineage gods, who are female, slack, and evil, had them locked up. The world and all of humankind are really polluted and disgusting, and we need to be cleansed so we can help to create the new divine era. There's a lot of serious compensation and cleaning to go through first, though, which Mahakari calls Misogi Harahi. Here's one of the many teachings about it. The I here is God speaking directly in their Bible, Gosegan. The earth is contaminated fully with spiritual poison, producing a foul scent in the divine realm. The very time is approaching when I cannot but carry out the great Misogi Harahi of this earth. Do humans recognize a means to stop this chaos with their intellect and power? Unfortunately, they do not. They will end up being blown away. So, Sukiyo Mahakari has the mission to find and nurture, quote, seed people for the new holy civilization and basically help the new divine era come about, uniting all people and religions in the world. By the way, just joining Mahakari doesn't qualify you to become a seed person. No, you're a candidate. 
you never know if you qualified really. There's no certainty. This is the sort of message we were told constantly, and this is also from Gosegen. If you wish to become God's chosen people for the age hereafter, you should not be controlled by temporary and man-made religions and religious sects. You should keep a burning desire to accomplish God's will and the divine plan and persistently make effort day and night to manifest the condition of God's kingdom upon the earth. And from another section of the same holy book, Always keep in mind the teaching, do not raise useless complaints based on human wisdom, and energetically push forward and put into practice what has been set. The matter of importance is to dedicate your whole being in making the name of Sunokami, the Creator, be glorified and accumulate meritorious service in various ways. It is foolish to spare meritorious deeds toward God and purification. By the way, all current religions are pseudo-religions, which God allowed to exist to put the brakes on humankind, giving moral guidance. But the time has come now for the true teachings and plan of God to be revealed, through Sukyo Mahakari, of course. Okada and his successors are the ones to guide humanity to work alongside Su God to create a heavenly civilization and unite all of humanity and religions. We have to erase our deep sins and impurities along the way to be able to be of use to Su God. Some of the sins and impurities are inherited sins for all mankind, and others are from ancestors and past lives, and others have been accumulated in this lifetime. The spiritual practice bestowed by Su God on Okada is raising the hand to radiate God's purifying golden light. It's called Okiyomi, True Light, Tekazashi, or Just Light. Okada was charged with the role of bestowing this power on anyone, making them a mini-Jesus or mini-Buddha. It's the same thing as Jorei, which Okada's original group SKK practices as well. I wonder where he got that idea. Although, of course, Jorei isn't as pure as Okiyomi, lol. We were supposed to give light to anyone and anything, anywhere and any time. This went from exchanging light with other members to giving light to family members, friends, pets, and strangers, and giving light to our food and cars and, well, everything and anything. In terms of our personal goals, achieving Kenwa Fu, meaning perfect health, harmony, and prosperity, is a big one. Another thing we're told is to, quote, be grateful for anything and everything from morning till night. Anything judged as bad with limited human knowledge was actually good. That gratitude one is a very effective thought-stopping cliche. I think it qualifies as toxic gratitude. It's ruined the word gratitude for me for life, actually. It makes me feel ill just saying it. I can be thankful, but not grateful. Another common phrase was to be always smiling, yakoshi, to be an always smiling, bright sunlight child, a good example of mahakari to the rest of the world. We always had to be aware of how we appeared to the public and present a positive, bright, happy attitude. I don't know if that really sums it all up. It's very complicated. There's a lot of Japanese mythology woven through the teachings too, and we were told that those fables are not fables, but actually literally true stories. No parables here, guys. And what is a Mahakari center like? Do they have an altar? Is there any more notable things that you might recognize if you were to walk into a place of worship for Mahakari and, uh, and kind of know where you were? Yes, the altar is the main focus. It's called Goshintai. Some people even have small Goshintais in their homes, which is a massive commitment. And you have to have done the advanced level training to be allowed to have one. When you first go into a dojo, there's shelves to put your shoes on. You need to have socks to wear or you can borrow socks from them if you've forgotten yours. The toilets are often in this more outer area. 
There's a water trough of some sort, sometimes a fountain sort of thing in the big dojos, or just a long sink, often with pebbles in the base to wash your hands and rinse your mouth. They have a lot of purity rituals. Holy books and donations must never touch the floor, for instance. Then you go into the ante room. There's often a reception desk and you sign an attendance book, which means they're tracking your attendance. These numbers are sent to the Japanese headquarters each month. There's an area where you can prepare donations with small paper envelopes and pens. There are usually couches and chairs, potted plants, and artwork on the walls. It's a very welcoming and calm place. There are usually some rooms for children to be in, offices and a kitchen. The priests, called doshis, live on the premises, so the kitchen is used a lot. They don't have their own bedrooms. They sleep in the main worship room. Beyond these anterooms is the worship room. There are often glass walls or windows between it and the anterooms, so its presence is impressive. This is the biggest area of the dojo and is a large open space filled with sunlight. There are often some large potted plants in here and artwork on the walls. Cloth-covered mats are lined up in pairs with a little pillow and a folded light cloth which is used to cover your legs when lying down on the mats during a session of light. It is a very serene place. If the altar is in a house, then it will have a whole room to itself. The holy altar is on the wall opposite the entrance and looks a bit like a Shinto temple gate built onto the wall. It has a tall framed scroll in the middle. The scroll has a golden circle on it with a black comma shape painted on it. This is the holiest bit, called the Chan, and where the true light from Su God emanates from, and there's black Japanese calligraphy beneath. This scroll is the Goshintai, and the one thing that must be saved if the building was ever threatened by some disaster. In fact, there needs to be someone sleeping in the building with a Goshintai every night guarding it. There is a small statue of a jolly Japanese character on a stand to one side. Izunome-sama, who is the physical aspect of Su God, the god of materialization. He has a sack on his back. There is also a framed photo of the founder Okada hanging up next to the Goshintai. Directly in front of the altar is a box or table for donations. There is always a vase of fresh flowers. So once you get to the threshold of the worship room, you bow, then walk to the altar, kneel on the floor, put your donation envelope into the donation box, bow twice, clap three times, and then bow down and say your prayers to Sue God, silently. Then you stand up, bow again, and walk back. If you're exchanging light with someone, you head for the mats and you start your session. Usually you kneel on these mats, but as a concession to Westerners, we were also allowed to sit on little angled stools to save our poor knees. Many of us had these mats and stools at home. Okay, and once you're at the temple, are there ceremonies you have to attend? Yes, there are a lot of ceremonies. There are short daily ceremonies for opening and closing the Gushintai. In the bigger centers, they may have curtains that close around the altar area. So you could attend a ceremony every day if you wished. I would occasionally go to an opening or closing ceremony. Not every day, though. Some people went every day. Then there is a monthly Thanksgiving ceremony, which is a much bigger production. Kumite from surrounding areas often travel to attend, and there's quite a lot of preparation beforehand. The whole dojo has to be thoroughly cleaned the day before, and people are lined up with different roles, like being a prayer leader, serving the dojo chief, preparing flowers for the altar, or offering an experience story to the gathering. Kumite brought food offerings for the monthly ceremonies. Fresh produce from your garden was especially prized. Also, alcohol, chocolates, sweets, rice, and so on. These would be arranged artfully around the altar on the day. There were special Shinto stands with trays on top called sanbo, where rice would be poured into precise pyramids and fresh fruit and vegetables would be arranged precisely. Everything looked very beautiful and was arranged with the Japanese aesthetic. These offerings were for God, but also after the ceremony was over, it would be divvied up and given to members, as it was now extra full of special light, even more purified and special than food we purified ourselves. It was called Hosai and was very precious. 
For example, if you got a small bag of Hosai rice, and it might only be a quarter cup, you would store it in a jar at home and add just a few grains when you cooked your regular rice, and it would make the whole pot of rice especially full of God's light. Hosai rice was great to give to anyone who was unwell, i.e. going through intense physical cleaning. Hosai food was a great thing to give to people you were trying to guide to join Mahakari, so you could give them an apple or a few chocolates with this extra magical energy in them, and it would help them be purified and to awaken, even if they didn't know it was special food from the ceremony. There was also ceremonies for all sorts of special days, like Okada's birthday, the Autumn Grand Ceremony, and plenty of others. The New Year's Day ceremony was very important. It was the first thing we do on January 1st to set the correct spiritual pattern for the rest of the year. We also held ceremonies in our homes for things like ancestors, altar, inaugurations, and anniversaries. There were a lot of ceremonies. How did members learn to give this true light? To be able to radiate this purifying energy, you have to wear a holy pendant called an omitama. God's light goes to the leader's omitama and from there out to your one. The basic one is just a plain round gold colored locket with a piece of paper with a bit of sacred calligraphy folded up inside. I only found this out after I quit and opened my omitama. We were never allowed to open them as members. You wore it around your neck on a secure chain and it had to be wrapped in all sorts of protective layers of purified paper and then plastic wrap, then a waxy film called parafilm, and then put in a crocheted sack and then a little fabric bag and pinned shut. Then you pinned this wrap pendant into a pocket you sewed into your bra or singlet. The omatama wasn't allowed to get dirty or wet or touch the ground or a seat or anywhere on the body below the waist. It mustn't be back to front either, so the front of the pendant was always marked on the wrappings. We were advised to wash our top clothes, like shirts, bras, and singlets separately from impure bottom clothes like pants, skirts, underwear, and socks. Like I said, a lot of purity rituals. It was quite liberating washing all my clothes just any way I wanted after I left, lol. If you dropped your omitama or touched it anywhere below your waist, or it got wet or damaged, that was an omitama accident. Sometimes God sacrificed your omitama to save your life, like in an accident, but almost all the time it was a bad thing to happen, a sign that your innermost attitude, or sonen, was seriously off that you'd been doing things the wrong way or committing something bad like adultery. Your omitama would have to be sent to Japan to be purified again and fixed, accompanied by a very large donation and apology. And you'd be interviewed by the most senior staff members to find out why this had happened, what the error in your sonin was. You weren't able to give light, of course, until you got your omitama back from Japan, which could take ages. Sometimes the regional bucho was allowed to repurify them too, but it still took ages to get it back. Everyone gossiped about you too. It was a shocking event. And so I never had one, despite being so clearly disturbed. <laughs> LOL. You were permitted to receive your omatama at the end of their primary initiation course, which is called Kenshu. Nowadays, they call it the spiritual development course. So... You were told this pendant was more precious than your own life, and it provided you with God's protection, as well as the ability to radiate true light to anyone and everything. We purified our groceries, neighborhoods, gardens, and cars. We even purified accident sites to save any earthbound spirits trapped there. There were a lot of rules about Omitama and the anxiety around its care and the withdrawal of God's protection when we took it off for showering or swimming or playing rough sports. This instilled a lot of fear. We often had nightmares about it. When people receive light, especially on the soul spirit, third eye position, they sometimes rock or sway. This is seen as an effect of the light and or attaching spirits. I'm convinced it is nothing more than the idiomotor effect, which is the same thing as seen in dowsing and pendulum divination. It's where a small natural movement of the body gets amplified and suggestion plays a part. 
Like we tell new people that if you find yourself swaying or rocking back and forth a bit while you receive light, that's okay. That's normal. Here's a quote from the primary course textbook. Give light courageously. God is not pleased when Omitama is idle. In other words, it is important to devote yourself to help bring salvation to people and to society with your Omitama based on the divine teaching. Give light any time to anyone or anything. Then you will see the opening of the door to a wonderful world of miracles that you have never experienced before. They believe everything has a spiritual aspect from rocks to machinery. Ancestors, past lives, and attaching spirits are very real. Did you ever experience any miracles personally? Yes, there were times when I thought I had. Like pain disappearing after receiving light, or a sore throat getting better after a session. One time, I got gold dust on my hands during a ceremony. My hands felt really swollen, and they were all glittery. But a lot was made of that. That was a real miracle to us. And of course, you're in a high emotional state, and everyone around you is excited at this physical manifestation of true light. It seems real. Now, I think all these things can be explained by more mundane reasons, like sweat drying on my hands, not the effects of God's true light. What are these attaching spirits that sound so weird? They're spirits that literally attach to your body. They might attach to you because they were lonely or fond of you in a past life or for revenge. They can cause disease and mental illness and can even make you see things that aren't there, like making you see red traffic lights as green to cause car accidents. 80% of physical disorders and illnesses are caused by them, so solving spirit disturbance is a major focus. This was done by receiving light and dojo staff conducting spirit investigations. That's where the senior staff giving you light on the forehead would speak to the spirit. People would often sway, nod, or shake their heads or make other movements while sitting there with their eyes closed and hands together in the prayer position. Some people would speak during this process. If the attaching spirit was Japanese, you might even answer the staff member's questions with hi instead of yes. But I never in all my years saw someone suddenly be fluent in a language they didn't already know, i.e. the spirit's language that wasn't English, even though stories of this phenomenon were reported in the journals. This unprofessional counseling session was supposed to help the spirit awaken and stop hindering or harming you. Spirit investigations gave an interesting pressure valve to members, actually. They were the one time you could actually voice off about the group and God in a safe way, through the voice of your attaching spirits. You could rant, cry, and carry on, and it was allowed. Although obviously your attaching spirit was very disturbed, the staff member giving you light could then say things like, Alice is offering great service to God here, and you mustn't interfere with that. It was one of the few times you would actually be praised for what you were doing or got any positive feedback because the staff member wasn't actually speaking to you. They were speaking to the spirit that was trying to stop you. Mahakari is also very anti-modern medicine, saying that drugs harden in the body and build up in the body to cause things like cancer and other diseases. There are lots of things that they classify as toxins, and receiving true light helps to melt these toxins. Things like fevers, diarrhea, vomiting, rashes, infection, and heaps of other symptoms are good because they're ridding the body of toxins, and you shouldn't stop them, i.e. don't treat them except for giving light. It's physical cleansing. Remember, everything is good. A huge amount of the teachings of the primary initiation course is about where to give light on the body for various so-called diseases and what causes the disease in the first place, and so on. As you've probably guessed, they're also anti-vax. Their leader recently said, Immunity refers to the power to overcome when bacteria or viruses invade the human body. A sincere prayer and the art of true light strengthen the immune system. Also, the heart of altruism could improve one's immunity. I wonder how that's working out for them during the pandemic. They do seem to be wearing face masks, though, going by the recent photos I've seen online. 
So the group was very focused on saving humanity and purifying the world. They say their role is to unite all religions, and they say anyone from any religion is welcome to join without renouncing their beliefs. But once you're in, you learn that if you're really enlightened, you'll see that Mahakari is the one true super religion, the core from which all other religions are derived. Members who continue to follow their old religion as well are seen as not very enlightened. They also keep you busy with their activities, so there's no time to go to church or wherever as well. The few Jewish rabbi or Catholic priest Kumite are paraded in public when the media gets too inquisitive or critical to prove they are inclusive. They do a lot of environmental stuff with organic farms and so on. The Japanese HQ sometimes purchases land around the place for yoko gardening, which is basically organic gardening combined with true light and divine principles. They are often praised for tree planting initiatives, picking up rubbish, and reforestation programs and stuff like that. Their New York headquarters, for instance, was one of the city's earliest green buildings, very energy efficient. It's a beautiful building. That's how they get positive media and social acclaim, and a lot of people are drawn to them for these activities. It was part of the appeal for me. Well, what about ancestors? Are they actually worshipped in Mahakari? No, they're not worshipped. But we had a very clear responsibility to actively look after them in the astral world and help them to elevate spiritually. There is a very strict family spiritual lineage in Mahakari. Your ancestors came first, then the man of the household, then the wife, then the children. This was correct order and likened to a river. Husbands were upstream to their wives and children were downstream to everyone. Most serious Kumite had ancestors' altars in their homes, and they were a lot of work. Other religions who have traditions of caring for ancestors were criticized within the group because they might only give food offerings to their ancestors maybe once a year on special feast days, and they might be uncooked rice and raw vegetables. Who would want to eat that? Well, we did it properly, giving them a cooked meal every day. What did these altars look like? They look like the Japanese Buddhist Butsudan, or simple Shinto Kamidana altars. You can find pictures of them online. They were small rectangular altars about 15 inches high, with doors at the front, and stepped shelves inside where the ancestors' name tablets stood. There was a light inside and a shelf that pulled out at the front to put their dinner tray on, and a drawer underneath for cleaning cloths and stuff like that. The altar had to be placed very carefully in the home. It had to be on a shelf in the highest place, i.e. top floor of a multi-story house, and the top of the writing on the main name tablet had to be above the tallest person's eye level, and the foot of each bed couldn't point towards the altar. You also couldn't display photos of anyone who had died within the last 30 years, as that would make it harder for them to give up attachment to their past life. We had all this cute stuff for ancestors, like a little tray with tiny cutlery and stemmed liqueur glasses as mini wine glasses, and tiny plates and bowls and mugs. Everything had to be new. Every main meal, they got a bit of everything we were having for dinner, and it had to be the best bits too, not just scraps, plus a splash of wine and maybe a cup of tea or coffee. Also, an unlit cigarette and a little ashtray plus fresh flowers in a tiny vase. Their food absolutely could not be microwaved, as microwaves destroyed the spiritual essence of the food, which is what the ancestor spirits were eating. I'd ring a special bell a few times and then call to the ancestors saying their dinner was ready. After they'd had dinner, we gave them a good half hour at least, we could remove their food from their plate and eat it, and their dishes all had to be washed separately from our regular dishes. I had to open the altar every morning and close it every night, do their daily meal, give fresh flowers and things like that, and inform them when we were going out or had come back home, give them light, read them prayers, heaps of daily interactions and responsibilities. I still have nightmares about my ancestor's altar, actually. Any Kumite listening to this will know that my nightmares are actually warnings from ancestors telling me how badly I've gone wrong and that I need to set their altar up again. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm so bad, lol. 
Not going to happen. In fact, everything I'm saying here is evil attaching spirits speaking. Not me, not someone with over 10 years of experience in this group who is looking critically at what they are actually doing and saying. Yep, attaching spirits. Is Mahikari one of the main religions in Japan? No, although they'd love that to happen. The most popular religions in Japan are Shinto and Japanese Buddhism, and there's also a lot of Confucianism and Christianity. Mahikari is part of the wave of Japanese new religions seen after World War II. There are thousands of new religions which flourished when they were suddenly able to get tax-free status. Not all of these fall into the cultish category, but Mahakari definitely does, in my opinion. Mahakari says they have over 1 million members worldwide, but I seriously doubt this figure. They don't reveal exact membership numbers to anyone, not even to members. I know that many of the smaller centers outside of Japan have closed over the last 10 years or so, or downsized from being in rented premises to being in someone's home. Most members are based in Japan, but they are also big in Brazil and have centers or dojos across the world. They have 20 centers in the USA. I haven't been able to locate census figures for the states, but my dojo had about 50 to 60 members on average. The Australian census from 1996 listed only 668 members nationally, dropping to 513 in 2001. In New Zealand, they only recorded 111 members in 2001. So I'm sure their actual membership numbers are much lower. No one I speak to has ever heard of them, so they certainly don't rank highly in cultiverse consciousness and don't have a million members worldwide. Were you born into this movement? No, thankfully, but my kids were. They were Mahakari babies, which conferred a special status on them. They were seen as very fortunate to have been able to reincarnate to a Mahakari mother and have received true light in utero and as babies. How did you personally get involved? I came across them at a community fair. You know, the sort of thing, stalls selling plants, cakes, and homemade candles, with a distinctly New Age feel. This was back in the early 1990s. Lots of crystals and herbal tea and tarot readings and such. The local Mahakari group had a stall under a tent with chairs set up in pairs so people could sit facing each other. I was intrigued. There was someone sitting there with their eyes closed, and the person opposite them was holding their hands up about a foot from the recipient's forehead. They were focused entirely on the person opposite them. I heard another person chanting a Japanese prayer or something, so I went over to find out more. Instead of running a mile, sigh. They were super friendly and warm, of course. They had a display with photos and information about their mission. I was especially interested in their environmental work. They had these jars of rice. One jar of pristine white rice had received true light and the other hadn't. It was all moldy. And rice can't have placebo responses, can it? It looked miraculous to me. I ended up receiving a 10-minute session of true light there, and I felt things, as they suggested I might, sort of tingling in my forehead and pressure. I felt really relaxed and calm afterwards. So when they suggested I could come to their center for a full session of light, which went for 50 minutes and free, I figured, hey, why not? I took their brochure. I started going to their dojo, now called Centers for Spiritual Development, once a week and then several times a week and gradually got more sucked in. The usual deal. Love bombing, lovely people, a miraculous energy to purify and heal people, and the whole world, a holy mission to save humanity. They were very into organic gardening and saving the environment, which aligned with me. I felt part of a new family with a new purpose, which had an active and miraculous way to fix things. And I must say, in all fairness, many of the Mahakari members I knew were really genuinely lovely people. 
They were intelligent, kind people. They had a strong desire to help others and save the world and work hard to try to achieve it. They spent hours and hours giving light to people, and this was always free. They would come to your house to give you light. These good, kind, altruistic people were, and still are, being co-opted by a manipulative and damaging group. Their positive efforts could be so much better used in secular organizations. Just about anything else that's not abusive would do. The Japanese culture within the dojo was also enticing. The thing is that it was so unusual and attractive just on its own, but it was mixed with the cult's culture. I couldn't tell what was Japanese and what was cultish. I knew taking your shoes off to go into a building was a Japanese custom, but washing your hands and rinsing your mouth? Maybe? How about bowing and clapping and making prayers at the altar? Making money offerings? All the Japanese names for things? The long Japanese prayer chanted before each session of light? It was exotic and beguiling. I couldn't tell when things slipped into being manipulative, as the whole culture was unfamiliar to me. I do think they are trying to reduce the japanese of their culture a bit. They use fewer Japanese terms for things now, I see. Like Kenshu is now called a spiritual development course. So about six months after I'd come across them at that fair, I found myself memorizing that long Japanese prayer and then attending their initiation course. I was so keen I even traveled across the country to attend the course, as I didn't want to wait for one to be held in my local dojo. So I got my own Omitama that allowed me to radiate true light and became a full member. I was stupidly enthusiastic. I'd fallen hard and fast, like evolutionary biologist Dr. Yuval Leor talks about with awe and fervor. I had fallen in love with the group, and they loved me, of course. I roll. When we completed the course and got our Omitamas, we also got an enamel badge called Goshinmon. It's a yellow star of David, shape, outlined in red. Inside the star is a circle with a green border with 16 gold dots around the edge, representing the 16-petaled chrysanthemum emblem of the Japanese emperor. They still believe that the Japanese emperor is of divine lineage. That's a whole nother thing. Anyway, inside the green circle is a white circle, representing heaven with a gold center, God, and a red vertical line, fire, and a blue horizontal line, water. You can find images online. We were meant to wear this badge all the time, on the left side of our tops. The left side of everything is the spiritual aspect, and the right side is the physical aspect. So we wore them on the left, of course. It was impolite if we wore it on the right. Did you have any family or friends involved at any point? Yes, but happily, most have left. I brought several friends into the group, and my brother. My brother didn't last long as a member, thank goodness. He saw through the shit. I was disappointed when he left, of course, because it was fun having someone in the family to share it with, but I wasn't about to cause a rift in my family over it. There is a high dropout rate, and it's seen as, well, God's given you this golden opportunity, but you've chosen to reject it. And they were ghosted. Years later, after I left, he told me that when he quit, they told him, people often get cancer when they leave, you know. Yeah, nice. Sure, you can leave any time, just overcome the fear they instill. He hasn't ever had cancer, by the way. I had to bring a certain number of recruits in to qualify for the second level course. There are just three levels, basic, intermediate, and advanced. You could only attend advanced at the group's HQ in Japan, so you had to be very committed to do that one. I did the intermediate course a few years after I joined. The Omitama for that is bigger and has an enamel design on the front with sort of a landscape picture on it. It gives a better quality of stronger true light, too. The others I brought have left, too, except for one woman who was a friend of a friend. She fell hard and won't ever get out, I suspect. I feel really bad about it. Once someone has been a member for over 10 years, they're less likely to quit. So I'm a bit of a rarity. I don't have any contact with any members anymore. 
What was education like during your time there, not just for yourself, but for, for others involved? There were a lot of classes. There were prep for Kenshu classes. A big part of them was learning the main world prayer, Amatsu Norigoto, which took over a minute to recite. It wasn't even in normal Japanese. Japanese people couldn't understand it, as well as us Americans. We had no hope. We were told it was this super ancient holy language. The spirit of the word was a big deal with them. You had to enunciate each syllable clearly and use beautiful language all the time. Swearing was definitely out. That's why I swear so much now. Fuck that shit, lol. We were also told we had to memorize the prayer because what if we were attacked or in danger and didn't know the prayer off by heart? How could we chant it and protect ourselves? We didn't want to be fumbling for a piece of paper with the prayer printed on it at a time of crisis. It had that much power. So the fear indoctrination started early, even before we joined. It took over a month to memorize. I can even still recite bits of it now. We said it many times a day, and before every session of light, as well as when we purified our groceries and so on. Alice has kindly provided us with a YouTube link to this that you can go and watch by following the link in the episode description if you would like to feel brave and check the video out. Then there is the actual Kenshu spiritual development course, which runs for three long days in a warm, soporific atmosphere with no time for questions. It was okay to fall asleep too during it. Great way to get weird beliefs into your subconscious while your logical brain is unhooked. And a lot of people reattend too. So even if there's only, say, seven people attending to join, Many Kumite reattend and help to run the event, and Kumite from further away will travel to reattend too. So you might have hundreds of people there, all bolstering you, cheering you on, literally. The three initiation courses had hefty payments. Oops, I mean donations that you were permitted to offer. There's the basic primary Kenshu, then intermediate, only offered in your regional HQ, and then advanced, which was only offered in Japan. In advanced Kenshu, you learn about stuff like Atlantis and Mu, which are real, and the prophecies of Nostradamus. It gets a bit crazy at that level. You need to be very deeply embedded to accept what they tell you in that one. In dojos, there are usually various study groups, sometimes to study teachings or ones for parents to help with how to raise yokoshi children or for teachers or for their various youth groups. There aren't fees associated with these, but of course you offer donations and gratitude every time you attended one at the dojo. Are you expected to recruit or fundraise or any of the, uh, the other things that we might see in high demand religious groups? Definitely expected to recruit. We were on the constant search for candidates for seed people. It was relentless. Anyone you had contact with was in your path for a reason, and you had a duty to talk to them about Mahikari. We were told, what if the world was at the peak of the baptism by fire, and we were okay, saved by God, and people we knew were being destroyed and suffering, calling out to us, you knew something that could have saved us? Why didn't you tell us? So we were told we had a duty to overcome any personal resistance, which was caused by spirits anyway, to speak the truth to anyone and everyone, all the fucking time. It's so embarrassing. I did stuff that drove friends away. I deeply regret that. Just by being weird, you know? Having my old personality change so much, talking about the cult and offering to give them light, or explaining about my ancestors' altar, which you couldn't miss when you stepped into my living room. I would approach anyone in public who had been injured or looked ill and ask if I could give them light. They were usually so startled that they would let me. Constant donations were expected, but apart from the monthly spiritual line maintenance donation, they weren't set amounts. They used to do door knocking, but had stopped before I joined, thank goodness, because I really did feel uncomfortable about that and don't think I could have done it. Is there any notable propaganda involved? Yeah, they have pamphlets, which they give out at community events if they have a stall or something. You could also hand them out to friends or random people you spoke to. Each region also publishes a monthly magazine which members pay to subscribe to, but is also used for guiding people. We were encouraged to buy extra copies to give to people we were working on, or to leave them in places like doctor's surgeries. 
The journal had teachings in it and lots of members' experience stories. So there's an American journal and a Latin American one and so on. What are the relationships like? Are they restrained in any way? Are you expected to only date or, or maintain friendships with certain people? How are the LGBTQIA plus community viewed? Are they accepted or are they shunned like we see in, in many other high demand religious groups? The correct order is to be married. No sex out of wedlock. In correct order, their husband is upstream, wife is downstream. The wife has to take her husband's surname. Ancestors are very unhappy otherwise and will send admonitions. After I left, I heard an awful story from some ex-members in Australia. There was this group of four or five Mahakari Thai, so they were in their late teens or early 20s, I guess, who had traveled a long distance to attend a major ceremony at the Australian headquarters. Like they'd driven for six or seven hours to get there. Mahakari Thai are really held up as shining examples of devoted Kumite, our hope for the future. They helped with running the ceremony in their smart uniforms, standing to attention, being helpful and kind. They were highly praised for having come so far to attend and for being so devoted and righteous. And then, on their way home, they were in a car accident. And they all died. Everyone was in shock. How could this happen? What happened to God's protection? They were Mahakari Thai. And then the dojo staff told everyone that, well, these Mahakari Thai members had been engaging in unrighteous practices, having sex outside of marriage, and this was God's cleansing. They deserved it. And suddenly they were the bad guys, the Mahakari Thai who were actually rotten to the core, who deserved to die. I just can't even, that is so fucked up. From what I saw, the LGBTQIA community was superficially accepted. I knew a couple of gay guys who were Kumite, but the official teachings were that it was Kya Kuho, back to front, not the correct way, and against God's will. It was viewed as being caused by attaching spirits. So I'm guessing any members on that spectrum would have been counseled to receive a lot of light and do a lot of divine service to, quote, solve their spirit disturbance. I'm not sure what sort of pressure they received from staff in private. Plenty is my guess. The more recent rise of LGBTQIA rights has happened since I left, so I can't really comment on how the group responds now. But their basic teachings won't have changed. I imagine that they'd be pretty unhappy about marriage equality. The male is represented by the vertical line in the cross, yang energy, fire. And the female is the horizontal line in the cross, yin energy, water. By combining fire and water, male and female to form a cross, a child can be born. Everything is very symbolic in Mahakari. So a gay marriage would be two vertical yang fire energies combining, which is gyakuho, the same for a lesbian marriage. Two horizontal yin water energies combining, also wrong. This is just my interpretation of what their likely response to homosexual marriage would be based on what their teachings are on marriage and sex. What about your free time or leisure time? Do you have any of this left? Are you allowed to participate in, in, in other types of activities or is all of your time given to the church and church related activities? Have holidays when you've gone to the astral world. For the first 49 days after you died, you could go anywhere and do anything. So they would expect that you'd save your frivolous holiday time for then, after you died. You are told to make a bit more effort than is comfortable, but more was always better. And other teachings would say to make constant efforts. The crisis point was coming any second now. They've been saying that since 1959. There's no time to be slack. If you did go away on holiday, you were encouraged to continue divine service while you were away, like visiting the dojo in another city, or giving light at a notable battle site to help save the earthbound spirits there, or attending a ceremony, or at the very least, take your prayer book with you and study it every day. Stuff like that. Just going away to relax and have fun wasn't really the thing to do. It showed you weren't that serious. Are you expected to dress or, or eat in a certain way? Yes. Women especially don't wear black, dress in a feminine way, not trousers, but skirts and dresses. Frozen foods, no go. 
Microwave ovens destroyed the spiritual aspect of food. Food colorings were no good, putting toxins in your body. You were poisoning your children if you gave them brightly colored candies. We purified all our groceries. Hosai magic food from ceremonies. How, when, and why did you finally decide to leave? It was a gradual thing for me. Soon after I joined, I told myself that no matter how hard things got, I wouldn't let the evil attaching spirits interfere with my divine service, and I would never leave. That really wasn't a very helpful belief to be stuck in my head. I am extremely loyal, and the first few years were exciting and mostly enjoyable, but after this time I really struggled with what I now know is cognitive dissonance, as well as my original personality struggling to resurface, plus massive fear, shame, guilt, and anxiety. I was told it was spirit disturbance. So many of the teachings were contradictory, and if I questioned them, I was told only highly elevated people could understand, and I should study more and offer more divine service. Over time, I got more and more stressed and depressed. I was doing everything because I had to. My struggles were labeled both spirit disturbance, the effects of my deep sins and impurities, and the resistance of evil spirits opposing all my good divine service. So I was good and bad at the same time? When I approached my upstream leaders, desperate for help, I was told to do more divine service. I was breaking to pieces, and they showed no sympathy. I allowed myself to not gloss over things that really bothered me, that didn't seem right. Like, I wrote an experience story for their journal, and it was edited to have miraculous events that hadn't happened and deep awakenings I hadn't had added. One time when I called a dojo chief for support, when I was struggling with a situation at home, they coldly told me that I mustn't be very elevated as I clearly didn't understand about the principles of cleaning the soul. A breaking point for me was they were pressuring my daughter to join up, as kids are allowed to become full members once they're 10. I think this is seriously wrong, allowing such young children to join. They are usually the children of Kumite and must have parental agreement, but it's still a bad practice. Children are welcomed in the group. There is always a children's room at the dojos so parents, well moms, could sit with their babies or young children to give them light without disturbing the people in the main worship room. We could be in there during ceremonies and the proceedings were played over a loudspeaker in the room. There were parent groups and special training and teachings to help us raise Yokoshi children, the future of the organization and the new civilization. They have different levels of youth groups, and the one for young adults, Mahakaritai, is quasi-military, with marching drills and uniforms and so on. There are a lot of teachings about raising youth correctly. So anyway, my daughter had just turned 10 and really hated being endlessly jollied along about how great it would be if she joined. She became more and more reluctant to come to dojo with me. They kept saying how great it would be for her once she had Omitama, and she was a Mahakari baby born into the cult, so she had a special role. I didn't want to pressure her into joining. She should have wanted to join, and if I was being a good Kumite, I should have been encouraging her to join, but also she should just naturally have wanted to join if I was spiritually elevated. Despite over 10 years of service, it appears it wasn't enough. I was struggling myself and being pressured by the dojo staff to get her to sign up to the next initiation course was making everything worse for me and her. We started fighting over it. My husband was also really unhappy about it and didn't want her to join. So that was a breaking point for me, after years of increasing depression and stress. It's like I could take the abuse for myself, even if I didn't label it as abuse yet, but not for my daughter. I couldn't let them do to her what they'd done to me for years and years. So this situation with her helped me see what they'd been doing to me more clearly. Eventually, I became suicidal and went through a nervous breakdown. I went to my doctor and she started me on antidepressants. I had fallen so much I was now taking medication, a huge issue in the cult. You shouldn't have any meds at all. I couldn't function. It still took a good six months of therapy, meds, and reading some spiritual books from other sources to overcome my terror of taking off the omatama and removing God's protection. 
Once I knew I was going to actually leave for good, I didn't tell anyone at the dojo and spent a few weeks finishing off my business there, asking for things I'd lent to friends in the group to be returned, returning things people had lent me, finishing off commitments and things like that. I didn't want anyone there contacting me after I left. Finally, I was able to remove the omatama, and my husband and I buried it in a forest far from our home. Before I buried it, I opened it. It just had a piece of paper with a Japanese character printed on it. Apparently, it's Sukwanushisama's name, because he was the first messiah, don't you know? I roll. I emailed the dojo and my closest friends there to say that I was out. I got a few replies and a few phone calls begging me to stay. The thing they do when someone leaves is you're never mentioned again within the dojo. You may as well not have existed. One time, a few years after I'd left, I bumped into a member at the shops and they had not heard that I'd left. Did you lose all of your inner friendships when you left the movement? Yes, there's an instant loss of social group, but that was okay by me. I didn't want contact after I'd rejected all the teachings. But they do this sneaky thing. They get a couple of your closest friends from the dojo to stay in touch with you long term. I know because not only did they do this to me, but I did it to others when I was in. These sort of ex-friends keep touching base with you, just checking how you're going, do you want to catch up for coffee, are you okay, how's the family. It's this trickle of emails and text messages, sometimes a phone call, sometimes a coffee date. They're maintaining this spiritual cord in the hope that you'll come back. It was awful because these people had been close friends and they were good, kind people just doing what they'd been told to do. And in the end, I had to block them. If something bad had happened, as things do in any life, like you'd had a car accident and you told your ex-friends, then this would be reported back to the dojo staff, who would then report things to the members like, well, you know that after Alice left, she was in a car accident, as a way of proving the loss of God's protection and instilling more fear in members around leaving. That was pretty much the only time ex-members were discussed, in terms of misfortunes or tragedies that had happened to them after they'd quit. So that's pretty mucked up. More proof for their fear indoctrination program. Soon after I pulled the plug, I came across Steve Hassan's book, Combating Cult Mind Control, and it opened my eyes so much. I suddenly realized that I'd been in a cult. I really hadn't even thought that before. I'm still reading and learning about the psychology of undue influence years later, trying to understand what happened to me and how to avoid it. What has your life been like since? So, so much better overall. I changed a lot of things once I got out. I tell you, my marriage was lucky to survive for all those years I was in the group. Not everyone was so lucky. So, my relationship with my husband improved a lot. It had been something we just agreed not to talk about for years. Our kids finally got immunized. My time was freed up. I ate ice cream. We got a microwave oven. I became an atheist. Mahakari vaccinated me against religion for life. But it's not all roses. Cult stuff still affects me. I used to get heaps of nightmares. I still get them over 15 years on, but they're only once or twice a year now. I wasn't particularly good at picking friends when I first got out. I hadn't lost my entire social group, thankfully, as I had friends in other circles like at work, but I did lose my closest female friends. The women who fill the gaps turned out to be largely manipulative and self-serving, often narcissistic. I was always there for them, and they were rarely there for me. It's taken a long time for me to learn about healthy boundaries and relationships. I seem to be a bit of a magnet for being exploited and taken advantage of. I'm slowly getting better at picking up the red flags, though. I still discuss cult stuff with my therapist now and then. I still have some automatic cult thought patterns and reactions to certain situations. Like, if I injure myself, I sometimes get the urge to raise my hand to heal it. I can still recite snippets of that bloody prayer, although I don't ever want to. Some words have been really wrecked for me, like gratitude. I can't stand that word. I can barely bring myself to say it. I can be thankful for things, but never grateful. The word light is pretty loaded for me, too. Like when people say sending love and light, 
It makes me shudder. I sometimes check people to see if they've got a necklace running down inside their shirt, especially if they're coming across a bit new agey. I don't like joining groups. Some of the fears the cult instilled are still there. Much less, but not gone. So it still affects me, but in subtle ways, I guess. It's like trying to eradicate mold and grout, lol. You can bleach it and scrub it, try to erase it, but it's still there, lurking deep down. But I'm also really proud of myself that I actually got out, because those old friends of mine, they're still there, and I doubt they'll ever get out. I hope they're actually happy, but I do wish they could get free. If I'm ever feeling shit about myself, I can say to myself, I got out of a cult, and fuck that was hard, and I did it. Even after over a decade in it, I got out. And do you have any advice for anyone in similar situations? I think it's so important to learn to trust your gut. I had lots of warning signs over the years and suppressed them until it ruined my mental and physical health. Education is also critical. Be skeptical. Don't take extraordinary claims at face value. If you're really drawn to a group, healing modality, charismatic leader, or an amazing, quote, business opportunity, search the internet for things that are critical of the thing, even though you like it. No, especially because you like it. Put the name into the search box and add words like debunked, criticism, and ex-members. Read what you find. Ex-members and whistleblowers are telling the truth. They're speaking out to help others. It takes fuck tons of courage to speak out. They're putting themselves at risk to warn and help others, not making up stories out of revenge and lashing out because they, quote, failed. Listen to those people. Believe them. Thank you, Roni, for your exceptional work in delivering Alice's answers to the questions today. For anybody who would like to hear more of Roni's voice, you can find all of her podcasts. And- Summer's almost here. Yay, right? So, when's the last time you tried on your swimsuits and summer clothes? If you could get back into summer shape in one visit, would you do it? Here's Dr. Brian Strand for Sonobello to explain. It really is quite remarkable. Sonobello doctors use a technology called microlaser fat removal, and the results are amazing. We customize your procedure to accomplish your goals. Just share with us the problem areas where you'd like the fat in inches removed. And in one visit, they're gone. Permanently. I can't tell you how often I hear clients say how many years they've been trying to diet and exercise those inches away. And we did it in one comfortable visit. It's time to get your summer on. Visit any of our Sonobella locations across the U.S. And right now, you can save $250. Visit sonobello.com slash save. sonobello.com slash save. That's sonobello.com slash save. And her book in my episode description. And there is also an audio book of Ronit's memoir, When She Comes Back, that Ronit has recorded in her own voice. So you can hear more of her there too. Thank you so much for everything you do, Ronit. And thank you, Alice. Thank you, for providing your experiences and your information, even anonymously. It's amazing that we are able to shed a light on Mahikari, that we're able to educate others around the warning signs and symptoms of this new religious movement, even if it is through strange ways. It's not always easy for somebody to come forward to give their name or identifiable information or to use their own voice. We don't know the exact details of people's current existence, and this way people are still able to get their stories heard and to be listened to and to educate others whilst protecting themselves and their anonymity as well. I feel it's extremely important to allow people who want to share their stories to know that there is a way to do it in a safe way that keeps their identities hidden and still allows them to be heard. So thank you so much, Alice, for allowing us the opportunity to share your story. And anybody who would like to get in touch to speak out about their experiences with Mahakari or any other similar high-demand religious group, please get in touch at cultvoltpodcast at gmail.com. 
That is the end of this week's episode. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find me at coltboltpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltboltpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, and this has been The Cult Vault. <laughs>